Welcome, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Welcome to our service of the day. We are living in very challenging times. I'm sure most of you have heard of the news of the closure of the cathedral. It is very difficult for all of us, but I trust that we will continue to put our faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And we will be hopefully reopening on the 3rd of April. So we look forward to seeing all of you as well. So we have come together to, to worship the Lord in these very trying times, but we place our hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Before we begin, just a few announcements. One of it is uh, this Trace Together um, app that was launched recently by GovTech and by the Ministry of Health. Uh, I encourage you to download it on your smartphone. Secondly, is to also download a very important app is our very own cathedral uh, app, which is called, uh, you can find it on the cathedral website, the Cathedral SG Life. It's a wonderful app. I'm using it as well. I can hear podcasts, lovely Christian music by local and foreign artists. So I just want to encourage you as during this time of rest, please soak in God's presence through wonderful worship music and encouraging words. And lastly, is on giving. Uh, as we worship the Lord, it is important for us to give as we, uh, to the work of the church and to His kingdom. So I just want to encourage you to use our online platforms in, in giving. As we begin our morning prayer service, can I invite you to just let's, let's be still in God's presence. Let's spend a moment in His presence to thank God for who he is, for our families, for our friends, for our church community. Let's be still and know that God is sovereign. He is seated on the throne. So let us begin. We have come together as the family of God in our Father's presence, to offer Him praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive His holy word, to bring before Him the needs of the world, to ask His forgiveness of our sins, and to seek His grace, that through His Son, Jesus Christ, we may give ourselves to His service. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I'd like to invite you to kneel and just spend a moment to reflect on our past deeds this past week. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to search our hearts. Let us confess our sins to Almighty God, and together we confess. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our fellow men in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Let us receive God's forgiveness. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us stand. O Lord, open our lips, and together and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Let us worship the Lord. All praise to his name. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. The appointed psalm for this service is Psalm 23. 
The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pasture. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever, word without end. Amen. Our Old Testament reading for this service is taken from 1 Samuel chapter 16, reading from verse 1. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord and invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me him who I declare to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? And he said, Peaceably I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. Then Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and get him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes, and was handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second scripture reading is taken from John's Gospel, chapter 9, reading from verse 1. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. 
The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, It is he. Others said, No, but he is like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, Then how were your eyes open? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes. And he said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now, it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Very warm welcome to all of you. And today I want to preach from a song in one of the oldest hymnal in the world. I'm referring to song number 23 from the book of Psalms. And this, by the way, is a pointed psalm for this morning. Song number 23 is by far one of the most well-known and well-loved psalm or song from the Bible. It is sung or read by many at the site of, at, at of hospital beds, in funerals, in family prayers. It is carved, printed, drawn, scripted and adorned on the walls of countless homes. And most of the time, uh, the image we have of this psalm is one of peace, serenity and beauty. Now, if I were to ask you to close your eyes for a few seconds, think of Psalm 23. What comes to your mind? What is the first few images that comes to your mind? I suspect most of us will think of pictures like this. Streams of living water. Or as you think of the valley, right? We, we think of a picture such as this. And of course, we think of the feast. The third image in Psalm 23. We think of a good home-cooked nyonya dinner. But let us suggest that the setting for Psalm 23 is actually entirely different from what we normally imagine. It contains images which you may not want to have on a poster in your bedroom. Take, for example, the picture of a desert or wilderness. In the midst of that, the ship struggling to find still waters. Or think of a dark valley. It looks rather like this, foreboding, right? Uh, uh, and in the midst of that, the comforting presence of our shepherd. And I'm sure you're not going to put it up, this picture up into your bedroom. Or think, if you're still following the analogy of a sheep, of a lamb being surrounded by enemies. What do you have here? Woo! Right? Not a very pretty picture. The sheep, instead of being... And this idea is that the sheep, instead of becoming a plate of lamb chop, uh, he's... Uh, while being surrounded by enemies, he's calmly enjoying a meal, a meal that's being served to it. Some en en enemies are seen, but as we know, the deadlier ones are those we cannot see with our naked eyes. And um, we are in that season uh, of dealing with an unknown and unseen enemy. And what might the settings in Psalm 23, what may it look today? This. Uh, don't forget in the midst of uh, COVID-19, the ongoing tragedy 
the country of Syria. I, my heart bleeds and just feel the sense of grief each time I think about what is happening to the country of Syria. Or a setting for Psalm 23 can be this. Valleys of darkness, the presence of an unseen enemy. So let's take a closer look at this psalm. Psalm 23, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. And here is the theme of this psalm. It is a song, and every song has a theme. So how great thou art, right? There are many stanzas to it, but remember, the theme is how great thou art. Or this is my father's world, a wonderful hymn to sing uh, during this season. Many stanzas to it, but there's a theme. Uh, this is my father's world. And so here is this, the Lord is my shepherd. This is the theme of this song and everything in this song issues on this theme and goes back uh, to this theme. The use of the image of the shepherd is widespread and rooted in the Old Testament. The term pastor, actually, that we use so commonly today is derived from this ancient idea of shepherd. It is almost unique to the Christian church. Uh, it is underlined, of course, very strongly through the shepherding ministry of Jesus Christ himself. Take, for example, in John chapter 10, verses 1 to 18, that Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. And there's a rich passage there about what it means uh, to be a shepherd. And the leaders of the early church, they had this self-understanding of their roles too. Uh, Peter will use this word interchangeably. Uh, take, for example, in 1 Peter chapter 5. Okay, 1 uh, Peter uh, chapter 5, verses 1 to 2. And he... He says, so I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder, right? Or as a fellow uh, pastor. Here, uh, Peter sees himself with elders just as a fellow elder, fellow pastor. As a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God. Again, you have this, of course, here it's used as, as a verb, right? Pastor, shepherd. Often used, it interchangeably in the early church. And of course, it's also used today. Now, uh, pastors today are called by many names. And we Anglicans also add into the mix as well. Right? And I've been called many names myself. I've been given many titles. Vicar Wong, Rector Wong, Canon Wong, Vicar Terry, Reverend Wong, Father Terry, Reverend Father Terry. And some to you very sure they'll call me Reverend Father Canon Vicar. Terribly wrong. <laughs> well, that's just a joke. But I sometimes say, why can you, you just you can just call me Pastor Wong? Because of all the title, this title is the most natural. It describes my relationship with the member and it's scriptural. Deeply biblical. That I am, after all merely an under-shepherd, uh, working under the chief shepherd. And it was uh, Thomas Oden, this amazing uh, statement he said, uh, he's a, uh, actually a patristic uh, historian, patristic historian, he has this to say, consistently, the term pastor remains the overarching analogy under which all description and functions of ministry tend to be embraced. The good pastor whose vigilant caring is an expression of Christ's own eternal caring. Beautifully said. Other important, other important images of ministry, such, such as a teacher, an overseer, a liturgist, an elder, a priest, and sometimes even in the modern world today, we call a pastor, a CEO, especially you can imagine, a huge place like the, like the cathedral. But all these become infused with special significance by analogy, to good shepherding. Pastor is a central paradigm. It is one that does not limit or demean, but enhances, 
centers and extends the meaning of all other ancillary images. I would like to suggest, suggest to be called a shepherd or a pastor is indeed a high calling. It is a Christ calling. And so here we have the image of God as our shepherd. Amidst a dry and arid land, He leads us beside still waters. He leads the sheep into a place where they can rest and feed and where they can drink. This picture is one of calm and tranquility. Not because a harsh environment has changed. Uh, do take note, no? the harsh environment remains. But because the basic needs of the sheep are being met, we have this wonderful saying, uh, He leads me beside still waters in the midst of harsh environment. And He restores my soul. And the word restore is another Old Testament term for repentance. Remember the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah said in chapter 53 verse 6, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And part of restoration is forgiveness. He restores, he accepts us into his embrace. That's a very powerful image of a shepherd. And he is doing this for uh, his name's sake. Isn't that one food? For his name's sake. I love that phrase, you know. Uh, the idea of one's sense of essential self-duty. If he is God, he has to, because he is God. And some of you who are fathers, you know. If you are a father, you naturally have to care for your children because uh, fathering is not a verb, not an act. It flows out of position, a sense of being. Well, let's move on to the rest of the psalm. Verses 4, For even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So this song moves on to the dark valley of the shadow of death. This often read to refer to death. Now, the, this phrase, valley of shadow of death, is actually a Hebrew term. And has a graphic way of expressing a superlative, deep, dark valley. Include, including the experience of death, but not exclusively so. Because there are some things that can be worse than death. You know, some people take their lives because they think they're going through something that's worse than death itself. But let me pause to say, there's something that's even worse than death. And that is taking your very own life. The very life that God has given you. And so the psalmist is saying, even though I walk, we walk huh, through the valley, through such moments, His presence comforts us. And He's not just present, but He is able. His rod and His staff is able both to detect and protect us from dangers. And this phrase, you are with me, God's presence, Emmanuel, is right through Scripture. Uh, and I'm reminded of the, the Lord's word, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 to 6. For he has said, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. Uh, that's the assurance. Never. The word is never. And so we can confidently say, the writer of Hebrews says, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? This is at the heart of scriptural understanding of suffering. What can man do to me? What can a virus do to me? What can a government uh, do to me? What can a criminal do to me? If God is with me. And that is a wonderful promise. We move on to verses 5 to 6. And you prepare a table before me, in the presence of my enemies, you anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows, and surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The last scene is that of being in the presence of enemies. In the midst of enemies, carries this sense of uh, immediacy, that they're nearby, uh, of proximity, 
that they're just next to us, that we are being surrounded. In the midst of that, what happened is next is a beautiful picture. You prepare a table before me. Right? You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I'm being served an omakase meal. I'm not just enjoying a meal. I'm being served a wonderful meal. The cook himself is waiting on you. It's not a delivery meal eh, that's been sent to you. Um, uh, the cook himself is there to serve you. I can still recall uh, while on sabbatical, I was in uh, Toronto, and I bumped across this brother, and he told me he was learning to make char siu. He was learning from this blog. And as he was describing his, the recipe to me, I realized that it sounds rather familiar to the recipe that I posted on the Food Cannon blog. Right. And, and he showed me the blog, and lo and behold, <laughs> it is my, my own blog. So I told him, you don't need to try to learn anymore because the cook himself is here. And we struck off an amazing bond and friendship throughout my sabbatical stay. I taught him, of course, uh, how to cook a, a good plate of char siu using, using the wok. And we had a great time together. And here's this powerful picture. Because eating a meal is about a time where of just complete self-satisfaction, if you think about it. We take a break from responsibility, from the worries and cares of this life. Two or three times a day, it's mandatory you take a break. And those breaks are very important. And you are satisfying yourself. And there's this picture in the midst of the enemies surrounding you. The Lord Himself is serving you the meal. He prepares a table before us. God is serving us a powerful picture of the servant king. The king himself serving us. A picture of a heavenly banquet. And brothers and sisters, Christians down the, through the ages have endured amazing suffering because they are looking forward to this heavenly banquet. They know one day they will be in the Lord's presence. For how long? And this is amazing. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Not just for some days, but all the days of my life. However long those days are, and the number of days that the Lord will be giving to you. And shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You know the word follow, right? The word follow um, might mean, might mean uh, to trail behind or to never catch up. For example, when I go cycling with Jennifer, I'm not just behind, I'm always way behind. That wouldn't be very comforting. Surely, goodness and mercy will lag behind me all my days. That's not how this should be interpreted. In fact, the Hebrew word is much more active than follow. It almost means to pursue, a literal translation, to, to hunt down a prey, to, to follow you, not tagging along lamely in a far distance, but it's breathing down your neck. He wants to be there forever. Water in the dry places, His presence in the darkest of days. He is cooking of a meal to nourish us in the midst of our enemies, to be led, to be accompanied, to be served. All the days of my life, He's close by, Parakletos, He's with us, He is near us, He is embracing us. We see, of course, the fulfillment of Psalm 23, the ministry of Jesus. Matthew chapter 9, when he saw the people, he saw them as sheep without a shepherd. His life is about the good shepherd coming and to walk among us. He hung out and ate and drank with us in the midst of our enemies. He welcomed all, especially to those to, the wedding, to his wedding banquet. And these same principles we see also in the church. Uh, each time we celebrate, we share a meal together every Sunday. The unseen celebrant is our Lord Jesus Himself. He is a cook. He is the one who dishes out the meal to us. In fact, Psalm 23 illustrates not just the life of Christ, but what the church is called to be and 
do. Down through the ages, the church has endured many ups and downs, many crises. Psalm 23 is not escapism, but a realistic picture. In the midst of all these wildernesses, valleys, enemies in proximity, the Lord is my shepherd. That is our constant refrain. It grieves our hearts, of course, those of us uh, uh, in this studio to hear, even as I preach, that two have passed away from COVID-19 here in Singapore. An Indonesian and a Singaporean uh, uh, lady, a person, both seniors. Please pray for them, their families, and let's continue uh, to anchor our lives on the one who can protect us, not just from the first death, but from the second, that's the spiritual death as well. The one who can grant us eternal life. And I pray as you're listening in, you will pause and give your life totally, leave it totally in the hands of Jesus. I was already moved this week as we were teleconferencing with the team from Grace Assemblies of God. And here is a pastor listening to their experiences our own Dr. Wilson Teo uh, shared, and he was almost moved to tears. And it was a very ty- terrifying experience that they went through. It was very moving for us to hear the experience, their experience as the first major church cluster. The sense of terror, the sense of, also at the same time, a uh, strange mix of shame, a sense of guilt. And you know, up to this point, they have not resumed their services. In a sense, they have suffered. And they've took the initial, initial blows for the rest of us, making it easier for other churches, perhaps other clusters, as we experience COVID-19 uh, to, to face the public, so to speak. So this is a shout out to Reverend uh, Wilson, Wilson uh, Theo and the team and the family at Grace AOG. We love you. We have been praying for you. And when you know that the body of Christ uh, stand with you, we are uh, uh, encouraged by your faithfulness uh, to just be faithful uh, in your testimony, in, in your faith in the Lord, in the midst of all that you are going through, we are with you. And for them, for you, we know that it's a very real, this psalm is very real and comforting to know that the Lord is a shepherd. And here in the cathedral, we have called this a year of discipleship. To dig deep, walls down, and bridges out. In a, a very unique way, I think we are being discipled. And I believe this is, can be a wonderful season to care, to love, and for that to come from our hearts. As we slow down on activities, as we slow down on events, on KPIs, so to speak, I believe we can be a more genuine as a church community. I believe through a WhatsApp, through a phone call, through a Zoom call, you can express your love and your intention uh, to be near a person, to care for a church, for, for a person. The church can be even be can be even closer. Leadership groups or teams can come, can bond closer together. Connect groups, ministry groups can come closer together. Friends, it's not about events. It's not about getting something done, getting business carried out. It's about this sense of, it's not even about the core mission we share together. Uh, there's a place for that. And sometimes the modern church gets it upside down. Uh, Jesus said by this, they will, uh, they will know that we are disciples if we love each other, not if we go and preach the gospel. That will come, but that is an issue from a community of love. A greatest commandment first, and the new commandment before we come to the great commission. I'd like to suggest that this season, uh, uh, the Lord indeed is our shepherd, and we can really learn to love each other more learn to care for each other. And you'd be surprised what so much more can happen during the season as we slow down all other activities and focus on the essential. And I pray the community in the cathedral will be stronger. And from there, likewise, our witness. Indeed, the world will know that we are disciples if we have love for one another. The Lord is my shepherd. And may that continue to be the team that will guide us not just in this season, but throughout of life. So let me pray. Father, uh, 
be with us. Let us, each one of us know you as our shepherd. Let us know the intimacy of your presence. And let us learn from that presence to reach out to one another. We give thanks for your word, read, preach and receive. In the name of Christ. Amen. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me lie in pastures green. He leads me by the still, still waters. His goodness restores my soul. And I will trust in you. And I will trust in you. For your endless mercy follows me. Your goodness will. my ways in righteousness and he anoints my head with God and my cup it overflows with joy I feast on his good delights and I I will trust in Jesus, and I will trust in you. Let us now stand and affirm our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. Together, I believe in God the Father, Almighty Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. And He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He'll come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, 
the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us now kneel and prepare our hearts for intercession. Lord, have mercy upon us. Together, Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Let us now pray the prayer that was taught by our Lord Jesus to his disciples. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Let us now pray the collect for fourth Sunday of Lent. And together we pray. Merciful Lord, absorb your people from their offences, that through your bountiful goodness, we may all be delivered from the chains of those sins, which by our frailty we have committed. Grant this, Heavenly Father, for Jesus Christ's sake our blessed Lord and Saviour, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Let us now pray the Lenten Collect. Together. Almighty and everlasting God, you hate nothing that you have made and forgive the sins of all those who are penitent. Create and make in us new and contrite hearts that we, worthily lamenting our sins, and acknowledging our wretchedness, may receive from you the God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us continue in a time of intercession as we look to God in prayer. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, you are the true and living God, the creator of the ends of the earth. You are awesome in power, majestic in holiness, and just in all your ways. You are transcendent, yet you chose to come to us in Christ incarnate to make yourself known to us. We thank you that through the shed blood of Jesus on the cross, he has opened the way for us to come into your holy presence. Father, we acknowledge our utter helplessness against the rising tide of the COVID-19 pandemic which has literally brought the world to a standstill. In a time when we, are faced, when we are forced to pause from the humdrum of daily life in the fast lane, forced to rethink our values and our priorities in the face of human mortality, help us to learn that life holds no meaning apart from you and death holds no fear for those who know you and are known by you. Put eternity in our hearts, that we may seek the things that are eternal and not the things that are temporal. We pray that this will be a time of deep soul searching and repentance. Repentance from the things that we have made our idols, the things that have usurped your first and rightful place in our lives. Forgive us, O Lord, for breaking your commands, for denigrating life, for touching your glory and for making ourselves gods and masters of our own destinies. Our trust is not in horses or in chariots. Our trust is not in our wealth or our intellectual abilities, but our trust is in you and you alone. Help us, O God, to return to you, to rend our hearts and not our garments. In our brokenness and contrition, have mercy upon us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You alone are the source of life. You, are the, you alone are the source of our eternal salvation. You are our good shepherd, in whom we have no lack. You lead us into green pastures and beside the still waters. You lead us in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil, for you are with us. Your rod and your staff, they comfort us. 
we pray for all government and spiritual leaders. Guide them by your manifold wisdom and counsel as they keep watch over us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Grant to our healthcare workers strength, mental and emotional resilience and protect them from infection as they selflessly nurse the sick and the critically ill back to health. We pray for the sick to recover completely. We pray, O oh God, you be so present with them that they will not feel alone in their time of isolation. We pray that you bring peace to their loved ones. Comfort and strengthen those who have lost family members or friends. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the midst of this deepening darkness, let your light shine. Open spiritual eyes to see you for who you are. Bring forth a great spiritual awakening and a global revival for the glory of your great and mighty name. Let us say the concluding sentence together. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us now pray the prayer for thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you most humble and hearty thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all men. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all, for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory, and give us, we pray, such a sense of all your mercies that our hearts may be unfaithfully thankful and that we show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honour and glory for ever and ever. Amen. Let us now pray the grace together. Perhaps if you are at home, I invite you to hold hands with your loved ones and let's say the grace together. May the grace of our love Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all evermore. Amen. Thank you for joining us for this inaugural prayer, morning prayer service of the cathedral. We hope to see you again next week. Stay safe and secure in our Lord Jesus Christ. God bless. <laughs>